Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Season 1, Episode 3 of the Small Talk Podcast on this Friday, March 3rd, 2023. Uh, and uh, again, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to our guest today, uh, Mayor Marianne Meadward of Burlington, Ontario. And before we bring her on, I'm going to bring on our co-host and Andy Carroll Woolery. Hi. Good afternoon. How are good you? Good afternoon. I am good, Chris. How are you? Good. I'm, I'm looking forward to our guest today for season one, episode three already with Mayor uh, Marianne Mead Ward and uh, really looking forward to speaking to her today about her career in media and now as the mayor of Burlington since 2018. Oh, yes. So am I. I'm, I'm really super pumped for this and well played and well, well organized, Chris. Uh, you were able to reach out to Marianne and have her come for March. And March is Women's History Month. And to have someone with uh, such drive and uh, balancing so much and a great example and mentor to women everywhere. Um, I'm really uh, so happy that uh, that the, the mayor of Burlington, uh, Marianne, is with us today. And I'm going to bring on the mayor of Burlington right now. Good afternoon, Mayor Mead Ward. How are you doing? Doing great. Looking forward to our conversation. Yes. Hello, Mayor Marianne Reed. Your worship, welcome <laughs> to the podcast space. Thank you. Um, for yes, me. it's 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 a very it's it's a very elevated position because you do have a lot of responsibility, and your worship seems a bit archaic, but I do love the pageantry that comes with it. It's very ceremonial, but you can feel free to call me Marianne. Everyone else does. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds well, great. Thank you so much for uh, giving us some time. Because as a politician and a mayor, a mayor of a major city like Burlington, I imagine your schedule is pretty full every day. There is no two days alike, and they are back to back. But today is a more casual day. I'm at uh, working uh, from home, uh, the home office here, and in my cozy sweater, getting ready for that winter storm that's supposed to wallop us tonight. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, apparently we're supposed to get 20 to 30 centimeters here in the Gulf area. So I don't know if Burlington Hamilton area is going to get more being off right off Lake Ontario. Yeah, I don't know, but it's, we're, we're being warned, put it that way. I, I, I assume that um, in Burlington, that the city is uh, responsible for snow operations. Yes. Absolutely. And we do sidewalk clearing. Some municipalities do, some don't, but we do absolutely do sidewalk clearing as well as roads. Yeah. Right. So from October to like April, it's 24 seven, I suppose. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I was going to also say today, I was reading on your Instagram, Employee Appreciation Day. I think that's great that you do that for your employees. Just makes them feel like they're uh, valued as a, a team member. And was that one of your ideas to do that, the Employee Appreciation Day? Well, I try to appreciate them every day uh, because I know that I couldn't do what I do without all of them. And, and I try to tell them as often as I remember, uh, which isn't often enough, but they are a great team of people and there's just no way I can serve the community uh, without their support and their help. So I am uh, truly, deeply appreciative of them every day. But today's Employee Appreciation Day. So especially uh, today, I'm going to thank them. Go ahead, and Ad. Oh, I was just going to say, and thank. I will thank too, uh, all city employees, and big special shout out to City of Burlington employees. Yeah, we we appreciate you, and and yeah, keeps keeps uh, the the city running and humming. And yeah, we couldn't do it without your city employees. Absolutely, very true. And uh, Marianne, even going back to your days of the Toronto Sun, I was always a fan of yours and I always enjoyed your work with the Toronto Sun. And I, I think I emailed you a few times too when you were a columnist. I think you must have because your name has been very familiar before we've officially had this opportunity to work together. So. <laughs> So hopefully in a good way. So I, uh, yes. Anyways, I'm going to get to some questions. Um, are you okay with 35, 40 minutes ideally? Sure. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Uh, the first question I'm going to ask you, we're going to rotate questions between me and my co-host and Andy. So the first question, can you tell my audience here in Guelph just a little bit about yourself? So I started as uh, my career as a journalist, studied a uh, Bachelor of Journalism at Carleton University. Uh, and really the, the idea of what drove me to be a journalist is really what inspires me as, a, as an elected official that I, I just wanted to give people voice. I wanted to use my words or my writing as a journalist to make the world a better place, to inspire change. And 
you know, that that was my lofty idea as a journalist that I would, you know, change the world uh, through my articles. And I think I did have a little bit of an impact along the way. Uh, can't can't claim to have changed the world. Uh, I eventually, as Chris knows, uh, became a columnist for the Toronto Sun and a commentator across multiple platforms, uh, TV, radio. Uh, and, you know, in a sense, I had the best job in the whole wide world. I was paid for my opinion. You know, what could be better than that? Uh, someone's going to going to pay you to tell them what you think about different things. But at a certain point in my life, I realized, you know, I'm just sort of standing on the outside telling other people what I think we should do to make our world better. And I really want to be the person getting in there and doing that myself. <clears throat> and so that's when uh, elected, uh, becoming an elected official sort of presented itself as an opportunity. And uh, so in 2006, uh, we, there was a municipal election in Burlington. My family had just moved to Burlington in 2000. I'm not from Burlington. I'm actually, um, I was born in the U.S. in a little town called Greeley, Colorado, which was, uh, interestingly enough, founded by Horace Greeley, uh, who was a newspaper baron back in the day. Uh, so maybe that rubbed off a little bit on me. A little bit of pixie dust, yes. There you go, yeah. And I only know that because as a young adult, I traveled back to uh, Greeley when I was on a road trip to Denver and Colorado on a ski trip with my husband. And we visited, we stopped into Greeley and I saw the plaque in the town square. And it's like, well, isn't that interesting? I have a picture of it somewhere. Uh, but my family moved uh, when we were very young, uh, kindergarten age, to Ontario, lived in several communities in Ontario, uh, got my... Uh, university degree in Ottawa, first job in Toronto. And then when we were wanting to raise our family of three kids, we didn't want to raise them in a big city. Uh, much as I love lots of things about Toronto, we wanted a slower pace, a little less crowded and frenetic. So we moved out to Burlington. And uh, I can talk a lot about why we chose Burlington, uh, but we chose this. I wasn't, this wasn't an accident of birth or heritage. Uh, we chose this community to live here. So in 2006, uh, in this this uh, inspiration to be the change that you want to see, I ran for elected office and I lost, but I got hooked. I can talk all about uh, what hooked me. Um, the next year, there was a provincial election. Uh, I ran in that election as well. I lost that one too. But what I learned, uh, that two things, I still loved uh, the idea of being elected representative and my heart was at municipal. So 2010 rolled around another municipal election. I ran and won and then won again my seat in 2014, won mayor in 2018 and uh, got reelected in 2022. So in a nutshell, that is my story of how I am to be the mayor of Burlington in 2023. Hmm. Did those setbacks, I wouldn't call them setbacks, but uh, did what happened in 06, 07 kind of motivate you to more to, to do well eventually? <clears throat> Absolutely. It it was, I always see failure as opportunity. Uh, and I, I, I go into lots of high schools. I teach, um, you know, I speak at a lot of events. And I'm very open about the fact that I lost two elections before I won uh, now four in a row. Uh, because I want people to know that anything worth doing is going to take some work and you're going to have some setbacks. You're going to have some perceived failures along the way. And so you have to turn them to your advantage. And one of the key uh, that the keys to life is persistence and not giving up on that first rejection. And, it, you know, if I'd stopped after 06 failure or after 07 failure, I wouldn't be here as the mayor, clearly. And and also it can be sort of a refining process. If you if you get blocked or stuck or you fail, in my case, to win the first two times, you can reflect on, is this really for me? And that's a really good reflection. I mean, sometimes when you, when you lose something, it means this may not be the right thing for you. Uh, on the other hand, it, it may be exactly the right thing. You just got to keep at it. And that's a discernment piece. That's a judgment call. And it'll be different for everyone. But but what I learned to your question, Chris, is I loved it. I loved knocking on doors. That very first election, I probably knocked on more than 16,000 doors. Wow. And, and I wow. only and we were out for 11 months because elections started in January back in the day and they ended in November. 
they've sh the province has changed the legislation and shrunk that quite a bit, but they were 11 months. So that's a lot of time to <laughs> knock on doors and I did. Uh, and I know that because of uh, how many brochures we kept having to print. We kept running out, you know, <laughs> yeah. print 5,000 or 10,000 then run out. That's a great metric. How much yeah, printing it really did we was. do? Like we can't, this box can't be empty uh, already. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm an auditor. So it's like, to me, if you follow the money and you follow the invoices, you get the real story there. You get the data, right? It's yeah, a real yeah, number. Yeah. And, and so I loved hearing from people about what they loved about Burlington and where their angst was or where their dreams were, or where the frustrations were, where they thought the opportunities that were not being realized. And one of the themes that I heard uh, in that election was people feeling like, I don't really know what's going on at City Hall. I don't find out about decisions until after they're made. That doesn't allow me to influence my elected representative in any particular way. It's kind of a done deal. It's over. And, you know, it's kind of FYI, we did this. And, you know, you get every four years, if you don't like it, that's the only opportunity to really have an impact is you don't vote for that person. And so I was thinking, you know, well, I'm a journalist. Like, I, I can do something about that. I could I could create a little, you know, newsletter or or website and email. And and these things were still back in 06 in their uh you know in their infancy, so to speak. I mean, That's I didn't right. join Twitter till 2009, right? And and Facebook, and it, it's all accelerated. We could have a whole conversation about the explosion of social media and how it affects elected representatives. But back in the day, it was email and websites. That was it. So I did, I started a website. I called it a better Burlington. Uh, I started a little newsletter and people could subscribe by email and I would kind of pay attention to what was happening at City Hall. I got used to going to committee and council meetings and sitting in and, and telling people, hey, this decision that affects your neighborhood is coming. And then I would tell people what I thought about it. You know, this is how I would vote if I was elected or this is what I think uh, the city should be doing. And. Uh, so I would sign people up at the door for my for my electronic newsletter in that election. And, you know, I remember uh, I didn't know anything about campaigning, by the way, when I started. I knew nothing. I had never been on a campaign. I didn't know what it was all about. Didn't know how to run a campaign. It was me and my husband, basically, when I started. <laughs> and so uh, I thought, well, I'll, I'll ask some people who know about this stuff. And the advice I got was oh don't ask for people's email at the door they'll never give it to you and only spend a minute or two at each door because you got a lot of doors so just ask them if they're going to vote for you and then move on and i thought but nobody knows me hmm. you know it's not like party politics where it's like are you a liberal or conservative ram dp or green or what have you and check the box and move on uh but even then not the best strategy uh you know i thought well i have to kind of i'm new to burlington i've only lived here six years a lot of people don't know me. I'm running against an incumbent who'd been in office for two to three terms by that point. That would be difficult. Yeah. Right. And and so it's like they, they're going to have to get to know me and what I'm about and why I'm running. And so I'm going to talk to folks. So there were times when I'd spend half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour at a door. Broke all the campaign rules. And yet those conversations now, those folks still remember me. I know them very well. Uh, I've some of them I've knocked on their door multiple times and we've gotten to know each other and they still remember as somebody who wasn't anybody back in the day spending that kind of time listening to them and learning about the city it was the best education about the city that that I could have ever gotten uh, the other bit of advice about you know nobody will give you an email at the door because I'd spent the kind of time I did explaining who I was and people thought nah she seems like a normal person, you know. I collected almost a thousand emails in that first campaign. There's a database That's right there. That's amazing. That is amazing. Right? And so sometimes, I guess what I'm driving at there is that sometimes you have to go with your gut and your instinct and what feels right for you and ignore the wisdom of people who've done it their way for a long time. Right. I did it my way and it, it actually paid off. And, and then the final thing I did, which was really interesting, uh, learning for me, uh, I, I thought, well, I'll take the electronic newsletter and I'll just package it up into like an eight and a half by 11, just to show people like, this is what you're going to get, you know, because if you're going to give me your email, you want to know, you know, and it's like, well, it's this. So here's the, the mock-up. 
here's a mock-up. Yeah. Uh, it was black and white. It was like literally folded on my kitchen table. Uh, you know, get little dog-eared, you know, not high paper quality. <laughs> and, you know, and then I also had this lovely glossy brochure all about me, right? Elect me and blah, blah, blah. And I would, I would have both at the door with me. And I would say, hi, I'm Marianne and I'm running for, here's uh, my brochure. Oh, and I also do this, you know, I've learned that people don't know what's going on and they want to know what people uh, stand for. So I've done this newsletter and I'd love to send it to you if you give me your email. Well, the glossy brochure went into the recycling instantly. The newsletter got passed around. Yes. It, st it stuck around. And people, I remember after I'd knocked on so many doors, you reached this saturation point. And by, uh, by towards the end of the campaign, I would knock on a door and somebody would be like, I already know who you are, my neighbor, my mom, my in-law, my whatever. Mm. You knocked on their door two weeks ago. Brilliant. And, and, and they would have like this dog-eared copy. <laughs> and I thought I better get a better paper, paper quality. And I would run out of that too. So constantly running over to Staples to get those re reprinted back in the day. I now have a printer in my house, but um, anyways, that it was a really, I learned so many things in, in that election and uh, put all of that to good use in the two, 2007. That one was very different because you're, it's party politics, right? You have a, you have a central party doing a major campaign, getting all the, you know, basically people will first vote party and then who the person is Correct. is really important, right? So it was very different. Um, but both elections got me a lot of name recognition, which is so critically important in municipal. It allowed me to learn even more about the community, go into other parts of the city, because in, in the municipal election, you just run in one ward. So I was very well known in that ward, but nowhere else. And uh, so it all of that was put to good use, right? There was nothing lost in that. So I don't look at it as a failure. I look at it as a learning opportunity that allowed me to get a better handle and be better prepared for the time that I actually wanted to just step right into the job and, and get going. Because I knew the city, I knew the issues, people knew what I stood for. I had a solid database of people that I could communicate with so that you've got this constant feedback loop. And, um, and the other thing, the final thing that I'll say is every election, except when I'm running for my own seat again, I've run against an incumbent. So oh, people yeah. say you can't beat an incumbent. Well, I did twice. I lost twice to incumbents as well, but I've always run against incumbents. I've never waited for the seat to be open uh, to have it more convenient for me to run. So you got to pick your own timing as well. And I did. So, so that's why I'm here. That's Absolutely. a great story. And Andy, just give me one second. I'll let you ask the next question. I wanted to ask you this as well, because I'm trying to brush up on politics. As for a mayor of a city, I'll, how long is a term? Is it four years, I think? It is four years. That actually changed for the first time in 2006. That very first, uh, it was three. Before that, it was two. And I think at one time, way back in history, it was one, if you can imagine, you'd be constantly campaigning, but it's four years now and, and it's set by the province. So we know the dates in perpetuity every four years. It's always the third Monday in October is election day and uh, every four years. Okay, uh, Nandy, if you wanna go ahead with the next question. Yes, yes, I will. And I, I will. I love your story about uh, about learning from failure. And it's not failure; it's learning. And to me, it's only failure if you haven't tried. If you haven't tried, then you've you've mm -hmm. you're like, yeah, yeah, I've automatically failed. So love that story. Thank you for sharing that, Marianne. Thank uh, you. Too. So my question yeah. is, um, going back to your to your journalist career, when you were in the media industry and first starting up new journalists, did you have a mentor? And what sort of lessons did they pass on to you? I did my my first. I had several, uh, but but I'll talk about one, and that was my first boss. Uh, so I got hired at a National uh, Religious Magazine when I graduated from journalism school as their news editor. And so my boss Audrey uh, was, I would say, my first mentor. And she, uh, I, I think, her skill was to diplomatically be a truth teller. So, and that, if you want to mentor people, you can't sugarcoat things. 
you can't or you can't withhold the advice that somebody needs but you got to offer it in a kind and respectful way or else it won't be received and so she knew that i wanted to be a, be an opinion writer right uh, that was my goal i want to i want to be a commentator and i want to be an opinion writer and so she um it was about a year or two on the job and she said look why don't you try your hand at writing a column you know whatever you want to write about but we had been talking about some things that had been happening in the news and and there'd been a lot of religious scandals so i i cut my teeth in religious journalism mm -hmm. at a time of the the u.s televangelical scandals the money mm -hmm. laundering the uh the sex scandals uh in the catholic church as well i mean it was a time where <clears throat> people were saying you know the the church is like an institution and should should be covered from that perspective uh because people's money their lives are being are being hurt when uh church leaders don't behave the way they should and so uh so that's when i entered uh, journalism so you know that was such a big topic and and for people that were people of faith or who valued the church for all the other good things that it does this was really affecting their their faith and their you know probably their all... their relationships with other people who were questioning what was happening Absolutely. with their institutions right yeah and so so we talked about that and i thought well i'll write something about how you can separate the the good teachings and the valuable things that you get out of your religious uh, uh, experience and your religious home uh, and the people that you know from some of the failings of the human beings who are also in your religious circles so that's that's uh, what it was about and I, I was very proud and i wrote it and i sent it to her and she called me in and she said this isn't your best work Mm. <laughs> dum, dum, dum. Uh -huh. <laughs> and and the really interesting thing which i think is is quite uh forward thinking and it's really i come back to that conversation in a lot of different contexts now she said you're being very judgmental you need to you know people are hurting out there like you need to understand and and respond like these are difficult things that you need to tell the truth but it needs to be compassionate uh, and it's not your best work because she says, I know who you are. This isn't your voice. Like you, you're th that compassionate side of you is not coming through is all the rational brain. And so I took it away. She gave me a few pointers. I took it away. <clears throat> and, um, and I rewrote the whole thing. And she said, this is fantastic. And I uh, went on to win uh, I can't remember if it was first or honorable bench. Anyways, I won a, a, a recognition award for. Oh, the congrats! Poem. Yeah, congrats. Uh, but if if the first one had been published, she was right. And so, you know, I had to. It, it, so I learned a lot around. And and she used to say to me, um, "Is are you just trying to um, have your say?" Or are you trying to get a hearing? You think about that. If you just want to have your say, you just want to spout off. And that's what happens on social media right now. A bunch of t Twitter warriors and social media, they're just blah, 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 poof. And they put it out into cyber. They don't care about the impact of their words. They're not really trying to engage you unless it's in a silly rabbit hole debate. They're just wanting to have their say, spout off. It's like a bullhorn. Uh, or do you want to get a hearing? Like, do you want people to actually receive your message and hear what you have to say and absorb it and think about it and maybe do something different about it? And if you want to get a hearing, you have to communicate in a very different way. You have to you have to be compassionate. You have to listen to other people and, and meet them where they're at. And that's what she pulled out of me. The first the first column she described as you're just having your say. You're just spouting off about what you think about all this. If you want people who are who are your audience to hear that and receive it and to to think about how they can use your words to make a better world for themselves, you you have to you have to do it in a different way. So, uh, so that message actually is a very good one for elected officials as well. 
Right. And I, and I was going to say, too, is credibility as well. And, and like I said, I use social media because I'm trying to get into a new career into the radio industry at the age of 50. And I try to make sure I double check my sources. And the thing is, you want to come off professional and your credibility and in any career you're in. Credibility is huge. Very much. And and authenticity. So people will be able to tell if you're your voice or what you're saying doesn't ring true to who they perceive you to be. You have to be yourself. And, you know, when I was um, first running in 2006, there was an organization that is encouraging women to run for elected office because we're still a minority, by the way, even now, and mayors especially. Um, so it was called Elect More Women, and they ran uh, training seminars for women who wanted to run campaigns. And that, that group is still around. So I went and one of the best pieces of advice was uh, actually from uh, uh, Andrea Horvath, who's now the mayor of Hamilton. She was uh, she was not uh, in city politics at that time. Was this NDP Andrea Horvath? Yes. NDP Andrea Horvath. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. One of the yes. special speakers. So they would assemble people across all levels of government, all political parties to to teach about, you know, what it's like to be an elected official, how to run a campaign. Uh, and and so I sat in on one of her sessions and she said, you know, you have to be you have to be yourself. You have to be authentic because the voters will tell they can sense if you're just trying to be what you think an elected official should look like, sound like, say you have to be yourself. And if you're not, you're not going to succeed in, in this uh, career because people won't they can they can sense lack of authenticity. And And that's part about being truthful and all of that. So. Uh, and then the other piece is just follow what you're passionate about. So, you know, there's a reason why, you know, most people go into elected office with exactly the right reasons. They want to change their communities for the better or their country or their province for the better. They want to make a difference. They want to make a contribution. Mm -hmm. That is why the vast majority of people put their name on the ballot. Uh, so follow that. Like, remember, you know, if you forget that why you are there in the first place, um, then you, then you, it's easier to run aground as an elected official or, or any other career, really, if you get if you get detached from what inspired you to go into that in the first place. Well said. Um, I just this is the last question I wanted to ask you about the Toronto Sun career. Uh, how did you end up? Uh, getting the Toronto Sun uh, job as a colonist and in your time with the Toronto Sun what was your favorite story you interviewed you did with the uh, Toronto Sun and um, the, the the newspaper industry has changed or uh, I guess shrunk quite a bit since uh, your time now it's mostly now 80% 80 or 90% digital now wow that that's a that's a lot of questions and a and a great uh, great questions uh, so I, I, um, it was really by happenstance, but happenstance and hard work. So, you know, opportunity will present itself in life, but you have to have been working toward that end. And, and so I, I knew I wanted to be an opinion writer. <clears throat> and so I started, I started, you know, practicing that skill by writing letters to the editor, by submitting you know, the column that I wrote for my own publication, but I wasn't their opinion writer. So that was very uh, infrequent. But I started by doing letters to the editor or submitting writing samples to other outlets. And, you know, I most of the time they weren't published, but sometimes they were. So I started to build up a, um, a track record, I guess, or, or a portfolio of opinion writing. Again, follow your passions. No one was paying me to do that. No one was, there was no deadline. It wasn't part of my job description. I did that because I wanted to do it and because this is something that I wanted to hone my skill at. And, and then the other thing is really comes back to that authenticity piece, like be who you are in all settings. And so when I was at the magazine, <clears throat> there was a national, every year there was a national uh, Canadian church press is what it was called. So all the publications from the different church denominations and religious organizations that published a, a magazine, they'd all get together. That's where the awards were. Uh, we'd get to meet people. And, and so um, once a year we'd go out and, uh, and, and, you know, rub shoulders with all these people and, and we'd get into these debates, you know, there was a lot happening in religious uh, circles that was very, 
worthy of discussion. Uh, that's where I, I learned in great detail, for example, about residential schools, because a lot of them were church run. So there were there were lots of really weighty uh, discussions and we'd, we'd I'd get debating with people. And, uh, uh, you know, that was just who I was, right? Uh, and so P I developed this uh, reputation as somebody who had an opinion about things. And so um, one of those editors, his name is Larry, he was asked to be on a TV show on Vision TV, which was the religious, uh, religious TV show of, you know, different people with different religious backgrounds uh, to come and debate issues. So Larry was on the show and Lori Goldstein, who was the editor of The Sun, he's still at The Sun, was one of the other commentators and a couple other folks. Well, Larry couldn't do the show after a while. And so they were asking him if he could recommend somebody. And he says, I know just the person who's got lots of opinions <laughs> and would love to share them with you. So, so they... Uh, you know, they uh, they called me and said, you know, he's he said you're uh, you're somebody that might be want to might want to come on the show. And so I knew this was like a huge opportunity. And so I was like, for sure, I want to come on the show. And, and and again, that was but you have to prove yourself. If I had been terrible in that first show, they wouldn't have called me back. So I prepared and I made sure I can contribute and and learn the roast. It was my first uh, real foray into TV. And so Lori and I did that show together for a number of years. And then I remember at the close of one of the seasons, he said, have you ever thought about being an opinion writer? <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, that's that's my goal, right? To, to be an opinion writer. And he says, well, have you written anything? And I said, actually, I have. Uh, I've got some letters to the editor. If you count those, he says, it's opinion writing, send it in. And I said, well, I did a column for the magazine that I work for. He says, send me your stuff. Um, let me have a look. So I sent him my portfolio samples. And then he said, OK, you can string a sentence together. Um, not bad. And, and then he said, I'll give, you, I'll give you a trial column. Give me you know, a thousand words by this date on this topic. And, and it was to write about Preston Manning at the time because he had a deep connection with the religious community. So he wanted correct, to write, correct, right? So he wanted yeah. me to write about Preston Manning, and and so I did. I submitted this uh, this thing, and he liked it. Had a few edits, but nothing. You know, wasn't a do over like my first. Uh, and and it was published in the Sun, and I was absolutely thrilled. Um, so here's an interest. Here's a funny side story I have to tell you. So you you know you're you get your first thing and you, and you want to like you want to keep the cover page of this this publication as well as your article the whole nine yards of you course keep the whole thing okay so that week in the life of the country and this is a Guelph story that I'm sure sure you're going to remember there was this whole debate about whether women can go topless do you remember that oh yes. oh yes 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 I do right oh yes Guelph woman uh decided to walk around topless was arrested for indecency and all of that and eventually uh the the rules changed that if men uh could go around without tops so could women um, also, that same week was the uh, Port Dover biker rally from <laughs> across Ontario and beyond. They all meet every year on like Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th, yep. Friday the 13th. So the cover story and photo the day that my column appeared in the sun was a shot of a the back of a woman wearing a, a leather thong, no top, you could just see her from the back and a leather, you know, kind of looking back like this leather jacket strung over and they were talking about the biker thing. And so I thought, oh boy, how do I say <laughs> look at this publication that I just, I just got my column published in. I don't know if they run a cover photo like that anymore, but back in the day they did. And it, so it's become kind of the joke that, that I had to like, you know, quickly flip to <laughs> I, I'll be honest, that sounds like 100% Toronto Sun territory. Like, that does not Toronto. surprise me at all. Well, it's what they do. 
<laughs> when I was writing for them, they still had the page three girl or yeah. page six, and then they moved it to the back after a while. And I think they dispensed with it. Anyways, it's evolved, right? Since mm -hmm. I'm dating myself because this, you know, this this wouldn't happen. Uh, I remember it all. So I'll date myself with you. Same awesome. here. Born in yeah. 72. So I'm, yeah, <laughs> I'm in the 50 club now. Oh, yes, exactly. So, uh, so that, that is, uh, that's how I met Lori. That's how I got the column. And, uh, you know, I do tell that story once in a while to people that are trying to break into the business to say, look, uh, follow what you love. Like literally that's, that's me. what it means. Like do what you love before you get a paycheck for it and show people that you can do it. And then when opportunity comes knocking, you're not empty handed. You can hand them something. And I just have my first opportunity. A radio station in Atlanta picked up my podcast show, and it's like hard to believe three years ago I, I couldn't get anyone to come on. And I had no viewers, and, and it's just hard work, passion, and, and just uh, continue to believe in yourself. Absolutely. It's a lot of hard work. And, you know, none of us arrive where we are now without all of that, without the pitfalls, without facing roadblocks, without getting up when we get knocked down and trying again. And, 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 and helping really hands just, along the way too. Absolutely. Allies. Yeah, absolutely. All that's and part of the journey. Exactly. You know, having people who are kind enough to come alongside you and tell you gently and with love what needed to be said uh, and, and you hear it and you get better and you move, you move forward in life. So all of that has to come together. And, you know, if anyone says they kind of got where they are, where they by themselves, they've, they've forgotten everybody who helped them. Along. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. We're going to get to our next question here. And this is going to be for my wonderful co-host and Andy. So uh, Marianne, for anyone in um, any sort of political level, but I'd say even more so for municipal, <clears throat> there was this thing called the pandemic, COVID-19 starting sort of March 2020. So um, what were your toughest challenges for Burlington? And even I'm going to just say something about Burlington. In, in these lists of places, Burlington is like the most livable neighbor city. Is that correct? Uh, very much. Yeah, we, yes. uh, we are, we're a great community and we aspire to be the place where people want to live, work, play. And in national rankings, Burlington is very high. Number one. Yeah. Number one, actually. Been number yeah. one many times in the top five anyways, over yes. the decades. So, yeah. so, so what were the challenges that you had specifically, um, in, in that, uh, in the, during the pandemic? There were several. Uh, the one, the, the the biggest one probably is just knowing what the right thing was, mm -hmm. right? It it wasn't clear cut. Uh, even the issue. Let's let's talk about masks. It it there was conflicting information early on, even from medical professionals, uh, that yeah, you don't really need one, and maybe it'll help a little bit, and in hospitals for sure, but. And then all of a sudden it was, no, actually everybody needs to wear a mask right now and we're gonna put a law into place. And, um, and, and so as you're kind of watching that unfold, you're not like, do I jump ahead of the public of health officials? Do I just impose something because my community is asking for it? Um, which they were in, in, in droves. And we ended up actually uh, in, in Burlington it, uh, bringing in a mask bylaw before other cities around us, before the public health uh, um, director that we had in Halton region never mandated it, said, you know, it's a good idea if you want to personally wear a mask, but but was not the one pushing for a bylaw. So we we had to determine as legislators what the right course of action is. Is this is this encourage or is this legislate? And there were a whole range of things. Vaccines, same thing. We had to talk about in the city where we're going to, were we going to have a requirement for people to be vaccinated or not? And each of, none of those decisions are easy. And, and that would it, be like for it, city spaces and employees, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the yeah. real difficult thing that we faced is that, you know, you, you can, you can legislate something that's easy enough to put you know, to put your hand up for a vote. That's how technically it is done. But then who's going to enforce that? And so what we saw, which was really challenging, is, is a lot of our front-facing customer service people, many of whom were high school students or university students, 
doing it, you know, for a summer or what have you, they were taking the brunt of uh, public complaints about this and having, you know, an 18 year old having to enforce a mask by law with a, you know, a guy twice her size screaming in her face. And, you know, this was, it, it was a very divided time. It was a very, I would say that the thing that, that went first was civility and decorum and kindness. Uh, you know, we saw, we saw online the, the rise of misinformation. We saw uh, people just being terrible to each other. And, uh, and then, and then these difficult decisions on the flip side of that though, just as much as there was an increase in, uh, I would say, hatefulness and negativity and division, there was also an in increase in generosity and caring and, com and kindness and and looking out for each other. And so we we tried to focus on that. I created on my website something called the Wall of Inspiration, where anytime to someone told us a story about somebody doing something in their neighborhood to just cheer things up and to try and have some hope and light and love during this pandemic, we'd put it up on our wall and, and you know, spread the message. And, and so both happened and, uh, and both are still there, right? Those didn't go away when the pandemic ended. You know, we, we have now a much stronger, more resilient community. Our social agencies, like our food banks, our churches, those that are naturally ones that help uh, people in need, they, are st they still have those relationships. Like they're still, their workload hasn't gone down. It, it continues to go up. Uh, even after the pandemic. And, and we've certainly seen a continued uh, division, unfortunately, uh, and not just in Burlington, but uh, around the world on some of these issues. So uh, yeah, so you get, you get both. You, you definitely get both. And I think myself as an individual or whatever organizations I'm with, um, that's, I, 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 I do still, I still have a choice. I, I can be I know people are motivated by fear. Let's say people are unkind because they're motiv motivated by fear. I still don't think that gives you a free pass. I, I still think you still you still owe the people around you respect. You should not be shouting at employees just because you're scared. And um, all I can do is just model my own behavior and if I, and, and, and drawn to positivity. And I absolutely agree that uh, a lot of uh, groups popped up on Facebook, you know, what we call care mongering, not fear mongering, but right. care mongering, where right. people needed help, you know, somebody needed pet food. And we said, I'll send you the e-transfer, just don't have a car, but I need I need these big bags of pet food. And it just made me feel really good that I could I could do that small act of kindness for someone. And and that's that's how I that's what I gravitated to. I told others about it and the big the group got bigger and bigger. And um yeah, I can be you know, we talk about snowflakes. I guess I'm a snowflake, but with enough snowflakes, you can make an avalanche, right? <laughs> well, and that the caremongering Facebook group changed their name to Burlington Together, and there's 16, 17,000 last time I checked, and they're still going strong. People share information, they share pictures, they share news, um, you know, and they try not to be political. I know they have an administrator who really tries to moderate and make sure it doesn't turn into, you know, a divisive platform. Uh, and, and it is mostly about helping each other. And, and so that those are the kinds of good things that have come out of the pandemic that are still with us and that will carry on uh, far after the pandemic has ended. Yeah. And that's where I put my energy. Now you are the mayor of a city. So you actually do have to worry about both, don't you? You do have to be able to do do some management of negative reactions and making sure mm -hmm. that your staff and your contractors and whatnot are safe. Absolutely. And and that, you know, there's no there was no manual for a global infectious disease pandemic, right? There was nothing to tell you what the right quote unquote decision was. And so there's I can tell you there were a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of a lot of wrestling and, you know, sometimes we had to change our minds. So at one point we had said, you know, based on what we know now, we're not bringing in a mask bylaw. Um, and that changed when, when uh, based on new information and based on uh, changing advice from health professionals. And so, so you've got to be willing to be strong enough in yourself to say, I, I did the best I could at the time, but now that I know more, I have to do better. And, and, and then you just have to wear that, you know, certainly people uh, will remind you of the other thing that you said. 
uh, uh, before and then they'll remind you or they'll, you know, say that, that you, you're incompetent. Or flip-flopping. Uh, they love to say that about politicians, flip-flopping. Yeah. 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 Always. And so, again, that's where authentic authenticity is really important to say, look, I, I, I made a mistake. I, I, or it's, I, I did it based on what I knew, but now that I know this, I can't ignore this. I can't walk away and just, you know, double down because I'm afraid of looking, uh, looking wrong or looking weak. Yeah. And it, it can't be pure gut. It has to be, it has to be that, that, uh, you have to inform yourself, educate yourself first. And then that's where the, the, where that's where the decision making comes in with your gut, but you do have to do the work and have the dialogues and have the education before, before you mm -hmm. make those huge decisions. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, it was, you know, it was, uh, I'd say I learned 10 years worth of leadership uh, skills in two <laughs> very, very challenging years. It was like having two full-time jobs managing the pandemic. I have a lot more uh, uh, breathing space in my life now that, that things have subsided uh, somewhat. And we can really focus on the business of the city now, which is why I got elected in the first place. Mm, nice. are you, are, Mayor, are you okay for a few more minutes? Sure. A couple more minutes? Okay, uh, this one I wanted to ask you is um, small businesses, how, how, how much were they affected in mm. Burlington and are they coming back now? Well, it really depended on the industry. And our, it was our tourism, our service industry that suffered the most because it's very labor intensive, very in-person right? Our restaurant industry, our hospitality industry, hotels, fitness, um, you know, uh, hair salons, nail salons, things that you couldn't do online, right? Uh, or you couldn't do in quite the same way. They really suffered because they were completely shut down. And, and the challenge is that the people who worked in those industries, they had to work. And so a lot of them retrained and went into a completely different career. And so that workforce vanished. And so when those restaurants and fitness centers and hair salons reopened, they couldn't get workers. And that is still with us. I've seen projections uh, for the hospitality sector that it will be five to seven years of recovery. Uh, and, and that's because people don't necessarily want to go, you know, what if we had another pandemic? once bitten twice shy, you know, you, you, do you really want to invest your life and career in an industry that, that could be gone literally overnight if there's a, a global pandemic and an emergency. And so people have gone into more stable uh, professions, but that's left a huge gap. And so there are restaurants in Burlington that used to do lunch and dinner. They don't do lunch anymore. They used to be open seven days a week or only open four you know, things like that. They can't get the the staffing. And that's that's true in fitness that I was talking to a, um, a hair hair at somebody who owns a salon and saying it's still really hard for her. So they are they are not recovered now at all. Some are recovering, uh, but it's going to be tough and touch and go for some of them for a while. And And some have taken the opportunity to simply retire and close their business down. So uh, now other industries did did really, really well. If you could if you could pivot to online sales, things picked up for you. Uh, if you could pivot, you know, some restaurants that pivoted to, um, you know, takeout and delivery and kind of saw that as a model. Uh, businesses, retail outlets that found that, you know, we don't need a thousand square feet and the rent that comes with it. We can have a little teeny tiny place and and do the rest online. I, I know bricks and mortar shops that for them, it was actually more cost effective to go completely online and, they, and they've and they never looked back. So some, some businesses, of course, if you were providing hand sanitizer or masks or medical equipment, you know, some industries that were able pivoted their whole lines to provide supply chain uh, for the pandemic, they did really well. So there were, there were certainly those that uh, there were winners and losers from an economic standpoint during the pandemic, depending on what line of business you were in and how quickly you could find an alternative way, if at all, to deliver those services. Okay, and uh, the final question I'm gonna leave for my co-host here and we'll wrap this up. And again, Mayor uh, Marion Mead Ward, thank you so much uh, for coming on our show today, Small Talk Podcast. Happy to be here. Yeah.
And uh, yeah, so just just a little more love here for Burlington. Um, so why would you, uh, can you tell our audience here, why would they consider visiting Burlington as a tourist, as a visitor? And what are your favorite attractions in the city? And I'm going to throw in mine as well, because I do like to, we, we always make one family trip, at least one family trip to Burlington every year. But what, what would you tell a visitor is, uh, come come visit Burlington. This is what we have for you. Well, actually, I live here because I was first a visitor to Burlington and I'm a hiker. I love being outdoors. I love. Uh, so we've got the Bruce Trail. We've got the Niagara Escarpment. We've got all the conservation areas all in this little neck of the woods. And so um, and I and I liked kind of the smaller pace, you know, when you, you when you look at Brant Street, you've got the, the you know the mom and pop shops. There were unique stores, some nice heritage buildings, and then of course, right downtown uh, Burlington is the spectacular waterfront park, Spencer Smith. And so we used to come out uh, to Burlington and and go to the conservation areas, hike on the Bruce Trail. We'd go downtown after and have a beer at uh, Emma's back porch, and you know sit on a patio overlooking Lake Ontario. And we just thought we'd, you know, died and gone to heaven. And we were living in Toronto at the time and it took us 45 minutes, an hour or more, depending on traffic. Uh, sometimes a lot longer than that if there was bad traffic to come out on weekends and spend our time here. And then we just kind of thought, what if we, you know, what if we moved here? <laughs> and uh, one of the reasons we picked Burlington versus any other small community in the GTHA is the access to the goal line, uh, because it was a, you know, it's a train ride into town and, uh, and fairly easy access. I still worked in studio once a week in Toronto. My husband worked in Mississauga, so we needed to get that way. And, and so the go train service was really helpful. And you're not stuck in traffic on a go train versus say a go bus. And so right. it was it was really the natural environment, our escarpment, which is a world biosphere reserve, and our waterfront. I call them the two jewels, the bookends and the cities in the middle. Uh, and then just looking for a smaller community where people know your name. Uh, you know, we'd lived in Toronto for 10 years. Uh, when we were single and childless, that was fine. It's very anonymous. You barely know who lives on either side of you and that's it. It's not, you know, at least that was our experience. Uh, but when we moved to Burlington, we knew, you know, we knew we started knowing the, the all the people in our neighborhood. And, and that I liked that feeling. I knew the people and the names of the people that I did business with, uh, the people that owned the shops and services who lived in the community. So it was very much like, a small town community, but it was a big city with all the amenities. All the so, amenities. Yeah, absolutely. That's what yeah. hooked it for us. <laughs> nice, nice. Wow. And so for myself, my draw to Burlington every year is we love the RBG. Wow. And I know that uh, our this is, this is Royal Botanical Gardens, which everyone says in Hamilton, but I believe some of the sites do fall on the Burlington yep. side. Absolutely. We, we yes. share it with Hamilton. Yep. Yeah. So we always hit the RBG. Um, and we uh, we pick a day that West Plains Bistro is going yes. to be open. Yes, that that is our annual trip. To. Yeah, we we love it there. And what is your favorite? What what is like your perfect uh, day? One one perfect date in 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 Burlington. Where do you like to go? Well, certainly uh, getting out in nature and having a hike and then a nice meal after. And I'm, I'm partial to oysters. So I go, I go wherever they, they have oysters in, in, which is funny because oh. it, it's not, you know, they're not from around here. They got to ship it in, but it's not Burlington them. oysters. That's okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Yeah. That, I, I love that. Now, Chris, I knew that we were going to wrap up soon. Can I ask that question about uh, work life family balance? And yeah. Then if, 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 and if, the, are you okay, mayor for one more yeah. question? Last, last promise. Okay. Pinky promise. Last one. So we had, I had Chris and I, when we started off, we were saying that this is Women's History Month in the USA and Australia and UK. And we're just so pleased to have you here uh, to join us for Women's History Month. Um, so as a female in politics, as a woman in politics, do you think uh, that there are more challenges for a female politician? And I will also ask a follow-up afterwards about how you achieve your, your, your work family balance. 
There definitely are more challenges for women. It is changing a little bit, but typically women still bear uh, the burden of childcare and household responsibilities. It is it is still more likely that a woman will take maternity leave, for example, when when she has a child, and so she's out of the workforce. Um, and and the key to being an elected official is who you know. It's networking. If you step right back uh, to raise your children for a couple of years, you're not meeting anybody. Uh, you're not networking. You're not getting out there. And and also just the the sheer fact of women uh, still. Um, you know, having to push pause on their career means that they don't advance as quickly, means that they don't earn as much because they're not getting those promotions or they're turning them down because they want to, um, you know, they want to focus if they have a young family. These are choices that typically male politicians have not had to make at all. And, but women do. And so um, it, it is more difficult for women to raise money it's more difficult for women to bankroll a campaign because they typically make less than men. It's more difficult for them to be networked. Uh, you know, it wasn't, it was in our lifetime that there were women only and men, like men only clubs, Correct. men only golf courses where the business was actually conducted. And a lot of that has changed, uh, but there are still those, that legacy of how families are structured and how work is divided that, that really make it diff more difficult uh, for women. And then uh, also attributes that are admired in a man, he speaks his mind. He's a hard worker. He really drives things forward. Uh, for women. He's passionate. Passionate. <laughs> She's aggressive. She's power hungry. Right. And, and uh, I will tell you in the 2018 election, so this is not that long ago, uh, there was a, a candidate who uh, registered as a candidate at, in a ward, but really their target was me as uh, as the mayor, and did flyers across the city uh, comparing me to the incumbent male mayor uh, with a list of attributes. I still have the flyer, and it was you know my name and photo and all my flaws with a, literally with a like a red X beside them. And then all his attributes with a check mark. And it was things like, you know, he's passionate, she's aggressive, she's power hungry, he's this and that. And and the one that got a lot of people's uh, interest was that I'm not good with numbers. I don't know how he... What what data was he, what data he was using other than <laughs> he's a woman yeah. bad at numbers? He uh, the, the incumbent at the time was a financial planner, so you know I'm bad at numbers. I mean, it was the most stereotypical sexist, misogynist. Thing. Oh my misogynistic goodness, misogynistic. 2018. That is that is only five years ago, right? Yes. That is not in the 50s, but it, it was kind of reminiscent of not that, that long ago. And, yeah, and it and it got uh, it was so egregious that people outside Burlington noticed. And I remember some elected officials at a different level, uh, a, a provincial level, just calling it out, saying, "Look, don't like her policies if you want, don't like her platform, don't vote for her." But this is ridiculous. This is just misogynistic, stereotypical trash. And it actually, the, the best part of that story is it had a it had a happy ending because people, the, the vast majority of people in Burlington saw it exactly for what it was, a sexist uh, piece of nonsense and, and threw it out. And in fact, some uh, people told us during that campaign, you know, the fact that somebody would spend that much money going after you made me wonder what you were all about. Like, why are they trying to take her down? Why mm -hmm. is she so, why is she so dangerous? Like what's got under their skin? They didn't know who I was. And and then they checked me out. And, and many people said, I had no idea who you were until I got this ridiculous flyer. And so I checked you out and I actually agree with everything and I want to sign and I'm going to vote for you. And so it had a massive backlash, but um, but that's the kind of thing that a male would not be subjected to, right? And and so I know 
you know, there are women that looked at what I faced and they're like, oh man, I could never go into elected office. And it's like, no, 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 don't, don't think that way. Like you can survive this, but yes, we have to clean up politics. There's no question. We have to clean it up because it, it shouldn't be a place where people feel like if they go into it, they're just going to be abused. Right. My one last thing about the, the balance uh, r- real quick, just one or two, one or two sentence, if you can encapsulate it. So now that you're the, in the driver's seat, mayor of, of Burlington, um, does that give you better control over work family balance? Or do you, are you have any influence on policies on, on helping yourself and your employees to have that work family balance, especially for women? I'm much better giving it to my employees than myself. Mm-hmm. I am not good at work-life balance. I will confess that is something I have not figured out. And um, I love my job. That's a good thing, but it's also hard for me to put it down. And this, this is a job that it that will consume every minute of your time yes. if you let it. And so I have to really practice saying no and putting things away. And that's hard for me. Yeah. But it is much easier for me to encourage my staff to take the day off or take a week or go be with family. You know, I, I'm very good about that part of it, but I'm I'm less uh, less good about taking it for myself. Oh, I I appreciate your candor, and re- maybe next time, remember you're an employee of the city of of Burlington as well. When when <laughs> when it when it when it comes to that, I'll give it back over to Chris now. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up, uh, Mayor Mead Ward. But uh, have you thought about writing a book at some point about your media career, your political career, and some of your stories? I absolutely have. It's actually on my to-do list to start sketching some of that out. So a lot of people have asked me that, and I think I, I might just get to that this year. <laughs> okay. And fi- and finally, again, uh, any quick advice for those looking to pursue a career in media? politics and where can our audience uh find you on social media or contact you uh via email so uh marianne.mead ward on facebook and instagram mayor at burlington.ca to get me at the city uh marianne with no e on twitter because it wouldn't fit so it's misspelled on twitter (laughs) that's one of the little anomalies uh, but my best advice is to, uh, you know, really follow your passion. You know, if if you want to do good in the world, you can do it as a journalist. You can do it as an elected official. And don't forget that that's why you went into it. And don't be afraid of failure. Stay in it. Be persistent and be true to yourself is the best advice I can give. And again, I want to say uh, I apologize for keeping you over. We apologize for keeping you over 40, 45 minutes. But thank you so much, uh, Mayor Mead Ward, for coming on here. And uh, I would love to have you. We'd love to have you as a guest again in the future. And uh, you're the first you're the first politician, first mayor to come on our show or even my uh, solo podcast show. And I really appreciate we both uh, appreciate the opportunity. I'm so do. used to doing my I, I, I'm just so used to doing my shows solo. But uh, uh, myself and, and Andy, uh, really thank you for your time. And we really enjoyed hearing about your current media and as being a mayor as well. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank for... you, your thank you, your worship. We wish you all the best. <laughs> thank you for your interest. It's been a blast. Take you care. too. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. All right, and Andy. Wow, uh, isn't that yeah. amazing, Chris? Holy yes. wow. I, I felt bad because we kept her a little bit past oh, 45 no. minutes, but yeah, you know, I, I think you have to say that they have to go. So no, no apologies yeah. needed. She's such a great yeah. and gracious uh, guest that we appreciate that yes. she was able to hang back and do that for us. But that was absolutely amazing, yeah. Chris. Wow, what a great conversation. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I could have talked to her for two, three hours because I know when she was with the Toronto Sun, uh, she wrote a lot of columns, and I actually agree with her a lot of her views. And I always emailed her back then before social media, and okay. I always, I always liked to work with the Toronto Sun and uh, her views and stuff like that and her honesty. And I, I, I check her out on social media, and I always see how she's approachable. And we need more Paul. Po- we, uh, my opinion, we need more politicians that are more. Uh, people friendly and approachable and and i think if every city had a mayor like her i think the voter turnout would be better for voting because i think mm -hmm. what's your take on that oh um absolutely um i was going to ask like what is i'll just share my takeaway from what she's i mean so many takeaways but my my favorite takeaway from the show maybe then you can share yours my favorite takeaway was about being your authentic self 
And that's, that's your starting point of your journey in life or career or family, whatever it is. And by being her authentic self, um, that is what got her on that, that show on vision, because it was very clear who she was and what she stood for. And, you know, going door to door and people got to see her authentic self. That's, that's, that's what was able to spread the good word and, and get, bring her into office. And even with that stupid flyer in 2018, um, because she had her authentic self to back her up. People like people said, yeah, this does not add up. And to me, that's that's my takeaway for today about being your authentic self. That that that's your starting point. That's that's your North Star. For me, it's uh rejection and 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 don't look at failure as a rejection as a learning experience because anyone that starts a new career and this goes for me i've had uh, successes but i've also had setbacks and you've got to block out the noise and if this is something you have a passion for uh follow it so her story uh for me is to never give up and if you have a passion pursue it absolutely yeah good great takeaway chris and uh, before we wrap this up, uh, Small Talk Podcast is looking for local area business to come aboard our show as a sponsor. If you're interested, please email us at smalltalkpodcast50 at gmail.com. We'd love to have you join us. We're looking for, for great partners. Local is ideal because uh, we, have, we, have, we actually have an international audience, but mostly local you'll get good coverage. And I want to say thank you to everybody watching this live streamed on Facebook, on the Facebook page for the Small Talk Podcast, on LinkedIn, on YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter. And if you can give me about 20 minutes, I'll have our episode with Mayor Mead Ward and my wonderful co-host and Andy Carol Woolery downloaded to 14 audio platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, iHeartRadio, etc. Uh, and Andy, as I, I've got to ask you before we wrap this up again, our next show is not going to be to April. Uh, have you have have you had a I'm guest? going to follow up with our guest. I have a very, very good lead. It's a local business owner uh, um, from St. Jacobs. So um, I will be following up with that person today and we will confirm our April guests very, very soon. Okay. So we're going to maybe, tr we're going to tentatively look at Saturday, April 25th for season one, episode four then. Already. Wow. It's amazing, Chris. All right. Well, I was going to say, I hope you have a great rest of the day, great weekend and uh, have your snowblower or your shovel out for this evening and tomorrow. Absolutely. Stay safe, everyone. You too, and Andy, and uh, we'll have this uh, downloaded in about 15, 20 minutes. Oh, awesome, and, Chris. Love your technical expertise. It's well, so appreciated. Well, thank you for coming on, and uh, I, I think the show went well today, and we'll be in touch soon. It was dynamite. It was so good. We'll be in touch. We'll see you guys later. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Bye. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap up uh, Small Talk Podcast Season 1, Episode 3 today here on this Friday, March 3rd, 2023. Again, I want to say I want to say thank you uh, for myself and Ann Andy, uh, for Mayor, May Mayor, uh, Mayor, I mean, Mayor, Mayor May, Marianne Mead Ward uh, for coming on our show today. I get, I can speak, guys. Sometimes I speak too fast, but she is the uh, 29th mayor of uh, 29th mayor of the city of Burlington, Ontario, as well. And uh, yeah, again, guys, the next Small Talk podcast uh, Saturday, April 25th. But the guest and the time to be announced as well. And again, guys, Small Talk Podcast is looking for local area businesses to come aboard our show as a sponsor. If you're interested, please email us at Small Talk podcast 50 uh, at gmail.com as well and i guess also guys just before we wrap this up guys again you can follow mayor mead ward on instagram and in twitter uh marianne mead ward and also general uh, everybody you can check out her website marianne mead ward .ca. And if you're interested in visiting Burlington, please check out the city's website at uh, www.burlington.ca as well. And again, guys, I want to say thank you to Mayor Mead Ward for coming on and my co-host and Andy uh, Woolery and Andy uh, Carol Woolery uh, for coming on today. So I uh, hope everybody has a great day, great weekend, and we're looking forward to season one episode four of the small talk podcast um probably around saturday april 25th so again 
thank you to everyone watching this on live stream and also on our audio platforms. And again, um, enjoyed uh, speaking with Mayor Mead Ward today, along with my co-host and Andy. I hope everyone has a great weekend, and we'll see you guys on Monday, March 6th at 2 p.m. Eastern for my 250th episode of Live with CDP Sports Talk with my guest, Paige Warner, a songwriter, musician, uh, based of based out of Ont Owen Sound, Ontario. Have a great afternoon, great weekend, everybody, and thank you for watching and listening to the Small Talk Podcast.